Bobby. Yo, I'm Bob. Totally blind since birth into Star Wars, talking about Season 3, Episode 4 of The Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. This one's the foundling 20th chapter of the show overall. Spoilers ahead, watch the episode before listening to my thoughts jumping in, and you were warned. I like spending more time with the Mandalorian covert this season. Now, I really enjoyed seeing Din and Grogu gallivanting around the galaxy, but Din spending more time with the Mandalorians as he's been redeemed got me very excited when I found out we were getting this. So, before the episode even came out, I think Carl Weathers revealed the title on Twitter. I, I think I remember seeing that on there. Then the Heroes Reforged guys reminded me of that when I was watching their reaction to, uh, to episode four. And um, I really got excited, though, because it's called The Foundling. And I really wanted a question answered that I'd had since the, the beginning of season one. Who whisked Grogu away from the Jedi Temple? We got that in this episode. I like the training montage at the beginning. We get to see Mandos with jetpacks. I loved Wesley Kimmel's performance as Ragnar in this episode. I keep wanting to call him Ragnar the Blood Edge because I play Blaze Blue uh, quite a bit. Just makes me think of Ragnar the Blood Edge. Um, he's a really cool character. And I like the paint dart challenge there as the episode really got moving and grooving. So one of my favorite scenes involved Din and Bo-Katan going over to Grogu. And Dan had to tell him, look, man, you can't play around forever. We're going to have to teach you the way. We're going to have to teach you what it means to be a Mandalorian. It's time you learned what it means to be a foundling. And Grogu's been very curious. He's been very playful, uh, seemingly very carefree. But this is a kid who, in his mind, has very recently been through something quite traumatic. Yeah, he's 50 years old, but Order 66 for him was probably, I don't know, maybe a month or two before that in his little mind. So this kid is quite hesitant to really show folks what he can do. He's seen darkness. He's felt darkness, I'm sure. And he's afraid to take that first step into a larger world, be it as a Jedi or as a Mandalorian. But I love how Bo-Katan and Din Djarin, they, they kind of help him through it. And um, as he is beginning that challenge, he's not doing so hot, but I like how Din and, uh, and Bo-Katan are there. And Din's like, man, it's all right. Just show him what you can do. And Grogu incorporates what he learned with Luke. And he actually comes out on the other side doing pretty well. He wins the challenge. And he puts Ragnar in his place just a little bit. We get the raptor showing up. He whisks the kid away. And that's really when the episode gets going. Um, I really like that Bo-Katan is with the covert as well. I do trust her a bit more after this episode. Actually, a lot more. I also trust Paz Vizsla as well. It was really interesting getting to spend more time with this character. So you've got Din and Paz and uh, Bo-Katan with the Shriekhawk team. And they're doing their own thing, trying to track down Ragnar. And then you've got Grogu and the armor. I kind of liked the, uh, the scenes with these two because she's not cooing and speaking to him as if he were an infant. She is really trying to teach him what it means to be a Mandalorian, talking to him like he's a little adult. And why wouldn't you? I mean, this kid seems wise beyond his years. I love that scene with them as they go to the Forge, and she's explaining how integral the Forge is to Mando culture. And then we got that flashback. And I gotta say, I love how well Justin Soule has written the scripts for the audio description tracks on Disney+. Plus. Uh, if it wasn't for this track, I would be totally lost. I still never take stuff like this for granted. And I had a ball with the flashback. Uh, we don't really get a lot of Order 66 when we see it. We always get little four, maybe five minute flashbacks. I think the longest might have been in the Bad Batch. 
but um, I really think that's all we need. Just little tastes of it here and there. I love the Jedi versus clones stuff that we get whenever we do see flashbacks during the events of Revenge of the Sith. You know, we've got those Jedi giving their lives for Grogu as they're trying to get him aboard the elevator. And uh, when he gets when he gets out of the elevator, we get to see a Jedi Master Keller and Beck. And I didn't recognize the voice right away. I've heard this actor quite a few times when he's not doing his Jar Jar Binks voice. My holy crap, it's Ahmed Best moment didn't come until the credits when Nicole Zanzarella, who narrates the audio description track, actually was narrating who was playing the characters in this, ep this episode because now we're getting the credits narrated to us, which I've been wanting since season one. So that, that's another cool thing about this season for me. Um, I had my prequel fan moment where I was 15 years old again, sitting in the theater, watching episode one, whenever she announced Ahmed Best at the end of the episode. And I was like, oh my God, that was that was Ahmed playing Keller and Beck. See, I hadn't watched the Jedi Temple Challenge game show. I mean, it's a kid's game show. Um, I think it slipped past me. So I did a bit of research after I watched the episode and I just, I like this character quite a lot. I think he kicked a lot of butt with his, uh, with his lightsaber here. I love what he did with the clone troopers, um, mowing them down. He force pushed one off the platform. They got in the speeder. They were pursued by a gunship. And then here come the Naboo security forces. And when we saw the starship and we saw the Naboo security for the first uh, couple seconds, I thought, oh, maybe... Maybe Padme has secretly sent these guys to help, but then I was like, nah, she she might not have done that. She, I, I don't really know. Then I was thinking, eh, maybe Jar Jar had a hand in this. Um, Senator Binks uh, should not be underestimated. And uh, maybe maybe the gun gun actually uh, let the security forces know, hey, this is something going down at the temple. You guys need to get over there and do what you can. I don't know who sent them, but I like the scene where more clones showed up. You had the, the Naboo security forces in a firefight there, and then you had uh, Beck and Grogu get in the way. And then we were right back in the present, but that flashback was, was, I think for me, the highlight of the episode. I'm glad the Jedi didn't turn out to be someone we already knew. Uh, I like exploring new characters, or maybe Jedi Masters that we don't know that much about. I mean, we've only seen this character in, uh, in a game show. But I like that he is a, a canon character here. And I hope we get to see more of this character. I, I hope they're not going to kill him off. But um, we get that really interesting scene with Paz and Din and Bo-Katan, and they're going to save Ragnar from the raptor. I love the sound effects that I'm guessing David Collins mixed in with the uh, the monster. It kind of sounds like a giant chicken. And then you've got the little baby chicks who, at least to me, it sounds like he might have incorporated some chicken clucks in with the baby raptors. As Mama Raptor shows up and she regurgitates the kid who is still alive, uh, definitely thought of a... Of a parent bird regurgitating food so the babies could eat it. Quite a disgusting yet quite a cool scene there. And then we get that really action-packed fight scene where you've got Bo-Katan going right for the raptor's eyes with her blade. You've got the, the Mandalorians trying to impale it with their um, the spikes from their cables. you got blasters going off. And I forgot to mention, we find out that Ragnar is Paz Vizsla's son. Which was a really cool revelation. I think one of the guys from Heroes Reforged, I can't remember if it was Hector or uh, possibly Adam, they were wondering about that a couple of weeks ago. I like watching their reactions. Um, so yeah, we get to find that out. The raptor is eaten, Mama Raptor is eaten by a dinosaur turtle because there's always a bigger fish in Star Wars. And then we, <laughs> we get those... Uh, chicks taken back to the covert and apparently they're going to have some vicious pets when these things grow up so i, I kind of want to see mandalorians riding raptors at some point in this show probably going to be a ways off and then we get that really interesting scene where paz thanks bo katan and uh and din for saving his son and i think i trust this character a lot more now uh, he respects these two 
uh, quite a bit more. And he seems like a pretty decent guy. Maybe he's just a bit curmudgeon -y. And then we get the ending of the episode where Bo-Katan does something I didn't expect. She actually tells someone what she'd seen in the minds of Mandalore. She's like, hey, uh, I saw a mythosaur. And the armorer's like, yeah, I, you, you get to see some interesting visions and things, but I, you know paraphrasing here, you, you probably didn't really see anything. She's like, yeah, I did. It was real. The armor's like, yeah, um, this is the way. Now I want to hear Emily Swallow say something like, I think you're cuckoo bananas there, Bo-Katan. Not that she would, but you know, <laughs> I, uh, I wasn't expecting the ending of the episode, um, to end the way that it did there. I liked the Mandos using their weapons, I wish we could see the big bad of the season. It's undoubtedly going to be Gideon. Uh, if not, I mean, I mean, it could be whoever Christopher Lloyd is playing. Hopefully he's playing Sabaoth or Sabaoth. I think there are two ways of pronouncing the name of that insane Jedi clone. Uh, maybe he's playing somebody else. It's probably going to be Gideon, though. There are rumblings that he escaped Coruscant. We heard about that in the last episode. Um, I had a ball with the episode, and I'm glad that the writers of the audio description narration tracks are reading the credits, because I think the holy crap, it's Ahmed best moment was uh, the highlight of the episode for me when when uh, listening to the, the credit narration there. I'm glad that uh, he gets to play a really kick-butt Jedi Knight. I saw an interesting take on Twitter, something like, oh, Ahmed Best has been redeemed and he gets to play a Jedi. I never thought he needed to be redeemed. I think Jar Jar Binks, I was introduced to that character at the the awkward age of 15 and um, I've never really hated him. I, I think he did what he needed to do in the prequels. Um, and I like seeing... Uh, Ahmed playing a Jedi. I've I've never minded the Gungans at all. Um, he never really annoyed me in episode one. He actually felt more like a teenager in, in episode one. A kid trying to uh, figure out what he's wanting to be. A kid trying to prove himself. But uh, I, I like that we get to see Ahmed playing another character here. And yeah, I'm kind of wondering if Jar Jar was the one who got the Naboo security forces to where they needed to be in this episode. Because um, we do know Gungans can really kick some butt in the Battle of Naboo, as well as in the Clone Wars. We got to see a lot of that. Anyway, this video is long enough as it is, and can't wait to see what's ahead for Season 3. Four more episodes to go, I think. Anywho, guys, till next time, Force be with you.